You're listening to Nest Talk, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. Now, here's your host, Christopher Linfont. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nest Talk podcast, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens news, opinions, and everything else podcast on the internet. Today we have an exciting episode for you. We are recording, actually, we usually record on Fridays, but due to holiday um, complications as we near Christmas here, we're recording on Saturday, December 21st, at approximately 10.30 in the morning. I know it's a day late, but, you know, we still have a great show ahead of you, still plenty to talk about. The Ravens game is still tomorrow. We have not missed any action, and that's the most important thing, so... Now, I did mention that we are undergoing, I I mentioned it quite a while ago, actually, over this this holiday um, time here, from now until after New Year's, we're going to be undergoing some changes at the Nest Talk podcast, and the first major change is that we are on a ton more platforms than normal. As I stressed um, in previous weeks, we have gotten onto Spotify, we are on Apple Podcasts, we are still on YouTube, as many of our viewers know already, Um, but we are also on a few others, including CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and Google Podcasts, and we are still looking at more platforms to add the Nest Talk podcast to. So if you are listening on any podcast platform and you you want to switch to any other, we are there on CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and Google Podcasts. But of course, our big ones are Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. So make sure you follow us, you rate us everywhere you can. It's very important to the Nest Talk Podcast to do that. Now, we are looking into some other things for the Nest Talk Podcast. Hopefully, I don't want to, you know, say too much, depending on what happens, what doesn't happen, but I do want to do um, new bumpers, maybe a new intro. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do just yet, so... Stay tuned with that, and we have some new exciting opportunities on the Baltimore Feather, baltimorefeather.com. We are actually looking to do something major this upcoming um, January we're going to start, so um, it would really help the the, the podcast, the website, um, for you guys to pay attention to that over on baltimorefeather.com. You will know as soon as what I'm talking about hits the ground, um, it'll It'll be big. We'll see. We'll see how it goes, but it will be big. I promise that. Um, and I hope you all enjoy it. And of course, it will definitely help the podcast and the website if you support us over there. So if you're on the BaltimoreFeather.com, uh, make sure you sign up to the newsletter. You either get a pop up or you can do it on the right side of your screen. And there, you get all the latest Ravens news, any changes to the website immediately when they're made. You'll get them in your email inbox, and that's perfect because let's say you're just chilling at work, you know. You're not allowed to go on Twitter. Maybe you don't even have a Twitter account at work, and you want to know what what if there's any huge Ravens news happening. Well, let's say you missed out on Terrell Suggs being released by the Arizona Cardinals last week, and you didn't know until you got home. Well, if you had that email notification, you had your email open, you would know because I published an article pretty quickly about the um, situation. Um, when he was claimed by the Chiefs. So you would know immediately that he was claimed by the Chiefs. You would know about our Pro Bowl votes when they came out because I published that within 20 minutes, I think, of the actual Pro Bowl vote. So um, being released, of course, the Pro Bowl vote being released. So make sure you subscribe to the email list. It really helps us reach you. And of course, it helps you get all the latest Ravens news and my opinions because I always love to put my opinions out there on the Ravens. Now, um, Make sure if you are on social media, you can find us on Facebook. Just search up the Baltimore Feather or Nest Talk on Facebook. If you are on, on Twitter, you can find us at Be More Feather or at Nest Talk on Twitter. And of course, you can find me, my personal account, at Chris Linfont on Twitter as well. Um, if you are looking to find us um, again on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube, just search up the Nest Talk podcast, Baltimore Ravens. Um, and you should find it there. And of course, make sure you like us, you subscribe to us wherever you're listening, share it with your friends. And we want to grow this Nest Talk podcast to have the best audience in the National Football League and the Ravens flock, of course. And I think we already do, but it's, you know, a small audience compared to some of the other podcasts out there. We've got a great audience, though. And I do love you guys every week for the support you give me. Um, it's really, really a great thing. Now, before we head straight into this news here, I do want to say one more thing. Um, Merry Christmas, everybody. You know, we are, this is the last episode before Christmas. I want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. Christmas is four days away. Um, if you don't celebrate Christmas, happy holidays for whatever you celebrate, whether it's Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, um, just a happy holiday. This is my favorite time of the year, believe it or not. I know it gets cold, you know, very cold outside, especially in Baltimore. 
Um, but it is my favorite time of the year. I hope it's your favorite time of the year, too. Just a lot of holiday cheer all around for everybody. So Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody listening to the Nest Talk podcast this December. Um, and like last year, we had a, a, a special Christmas article. I do plan on doing that again this year. So you'll see what that is. Last year, we did a, um, not a, I wouldn't call it a parody of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, but we, we laced Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol with Raven's themes to it and published it on the website. I thought that was, that was interesting. Not my best work, in my opinion, but but some people really liked it. They told me on comments, and I got some other people telling me uh, they really liked it. So we'll do another Christmas article this year to spread some holiday cheer. That'll be released on Christmas morning, so if you're up before your kids, let's say, or your kids make you get up and you want to relax a little bit before you go open those presents, we'll have something there for you ready to go. So, again, make sure you get to the Baltimore Feather newsletter list, um, email list, and there you'll be ready for all the latest Ravens news opinion articles and, of course, our special Christmas article coming out December 25th in the morning. Now, there's a lot of news this week, mainly surrounding two giant news stories. The Terrell Suggs saga, as I like to call it. Essentially, Terrell Suggs was released by the Arizona Cardinals, and there was a lot of hype around that. Potentially, him coming back to Baltimore was the idea. Now, if you know about what happened, that's not the case. Um, And, of course... We have the Pro Bowl picks that the Baltimore Ravens have. 12 Pro Bowl players this year, which is amazing. I think that's the tie for the NFL record. We'll go into that. And there's one minor news story, and that is Kenneth Dixon signing with the New York Jets. But to get in detail of all these, um, of course, it's important. And we're going to start chronologically here. The Terrell Suggs saga started, I believe it was December 23rd. I'm sorry, December 23rd. December 14th. I don't know where I got 23rd from. Um, you know, it hasn't even happened yet, but December 14th, I think it was a Friday, um, or something like that, Terrell Suggs, or Saturday, Terrell Suggs was cut by the Arizona Cardinals, released, waived by the Arizona Cardinals, and this was pretty shocking to most. It's not like the Arizona Cardinals have anywhere to go in the playoffs, okay? They're not stacking up with, with better players for a playoff run. I believe they are a four-win team right now, a three-win team, something like that. Have absolutely no chance at the playoffs. The idea was, the theory was, that maybe Terrell Suggs requested his release by the Arizona Cardinals. Now, we're not exactly sure if that's true. We don't know the specific details of why he was released. We know that Terrell Suggs was battling at some injury in recent weeks, but he was still playing in the games. So it's not like the Arizona Cardinals needed to cut him for cap space reasons. He's on a one-year deal. They were not going to the playoffs. He could have finished with the team and called it quits after that. The most likely scenario is that the Arizona Cardinals essentially felt bad for him playing on their team. And whether he requested or demanded his release or not, they wanted him to have a chance at winning another Super Bowl. That's my absolute guess here. But of course, I don't think we're ever going to know the exact reason why they cut him whether he demanded it or not, or whether they just wanted to move on from him and maybe look at somebody else for potentially next year because they know Suggs probably won't be there next year. Um, so that's that's the whole story about him being released. Of course, you know, him signing with the Arizona Cardinals was a surprise to begin with. Okay. Suggs and the Arizona Cardinals never were a thing For 16 years in the National Football League. 16 years he spent in Baltimore. And only Baltimore. Never really entertained the idea of leaving. Never really, you know, had any regrets about staying in Baltimore. The the jump to Arizona, as Terrell Suggs put it, was just time for him. Now, if you don't know Terrell Suggs, I believe he was born in Minnesota, but he moved to Arizona in eighth grade, spent essentially the rest of his life in Arizona. He went to college in Arizona. He lives in Arizona in the off season, to my knowledge. So his what he stated was he wanted to play for his hometown team. And you know what? I understand that. I really do. Now, I have another reason, I think, why Terrell Suggs wasn't actually going to sign with the Baltimore Ravens. And I said I wasn't going to actually say it for a while. You know, I don't want to put that on him. But I saw some other people saying it on social media, so it's not my exact idea. Well, not my... It's my idea, but it's not 
alone me thinking this. My idea, you know, my super secret idea about Terrell Suggs is that Terrell Suggs was not happy with the way the Baltimore Ravens were trending. Obviously, he was a huge supporter of Flacco for in the entirety of Flacco's career. Um, didn't like how the Ravens were, were kind of reestablishing themselves. And I don't think it was anything personal between him and, and the management. I think it was just for him, it wasn't the Ravens he knew. So I think that's why he left. Now, again, this is total unequivocal um, hypothesis. There is no theory here. I mean, it's just a hypothesis. It's my opinion of what could have happened, right? Because this is a guy who was talking for years about playing as a Raven forever, right? And to get up and leave right before the end of his con- right before the end of his career with a contract offer on the table denied by Suggs. That contract offer was according to him lucrative from the Ravens. He denied it. You know, I don't I just don't see how that could happen without some sort of rift existing between the Ravens and Suggs. Now, that rift doesn't seem major. Because Suggs, according to multiple sources in the National Football League um, that talked to Ian Rappaport and, of course, um, the one who broke the story, Adam Schefter, was that Terrell Suggs essentially w- was contemplating not showing up for any team that claimed him off of waivers. Now, you have to remember, even though he's a 17-year veteran, okay, he's still subject to waivers. I don't know exactly how the waiver system works. You know, I... I try to know as much as I can about the NFL, but there's so many ins and outs. You'd have to find someone else that actually knows the waiver wire. Why he was actually, you know, subject to waivers, I'm not sure. I believe, and don't hold me on this because I don't know, I believe he was subject to waivers because he was only on the Cardinals for a year. Now, I don't know what the time frame is, right, for how long you have to be on the Cardinals or a team to be subject to waivers or not subject to waivers, but that seems like the most logical reason to me. Again, I it's complicated. Everything in the NFL is complicated, so you never really get a clear-cut answer when you search for it. I sure didn't. Maybe someone else can find it and point that point me to it. But that's the case. He's subject to waivers. Now, here's how waiver the waiver wire actually works. This I understand. The worst team in the National Football League by record has a first go at it. And whatever player is put on waivers. The best team in the National Football League, by record, has the last chance to claim the player. Now, this is to ensure parity in the National Football League, so one team just doesn't keep getting stronger and stronger with with um, free agent acquisitions midseason. Um, I don't really agree with putting a 17-year veteran who was on a one-year deal. I mean, maybe it has something to do with the deal, too. Um, getting on waiver wire. Now, I, again, I don't agree with putting Suggs on the waiver wire, but I can see why it's done. Because, let's say it's the Ravens, right? Getting to sign him would only make him, them stronger. That's understandable. Whereas a team borderline playoffs might claim him and use him to make their team better. Now, the thing, I don't know, I mentioned he did something. Because the Ravens, right? He did something to get to the Ravens. He wanted to go to the Ravens. He essentially told teams that he wasn't going to show up if anybody but the Ravens claimed him. This is what he leaked to the media purposely. Purposely. He did it on purpose so that other teams would know that he might not show up if they claim him. Okay? And he had to do this because if he wanted to get to the Ravens, he'd have to survive 31 other NFL teams potentially picking him. And a lot of them could use outside linebacker pass rusher help. Especially the Kansas City Chiefs, as we're going we're gonna to mention in a second. So Suggs essentially tells these teams, I'm not coming to you if you're claiming me unless your name, name is the Baltimore Ravens. Um, that didn't work. And here's why it doesn't, it really never had a real shot to work. Because if another team either wanted to use him or at least stop him from getting to Baltimore... They had complete control of doing that. Essentially, claiming Suggs will not take up a roster spot until he shows up. And my understanding of how the waiver wire works, again, this is all complicated. These are, these are tricky rules. But essentially, essentially, 
if Suggs did not report, they would not have to cut anybody to get him on the roster. They're going to have to place anybody on the IR, move anybody from the roster. Suggs would just, his rights would belong to them and them only for the remainder of the year. And the Baltimore Ravens would not get Terrell Suggs. And for a team like the Kansas City Chiefs, that in it of itself is a huge reason to claim Terrell Suggs. Because if you're the Chiefs, if you're the Patriots, you don't want the Ravens getting stronger. You don't want the rich getting richer. You are in complete competition with the Ravens. The Chiefs and the Ravens have been going... I I said it already. I've said it. These two teams, the Ravens and the Chiefs, are the new Colts and Patriots of the AFC. The two teams that are not in the same division, but are going to battle it out. They're the Cowboys and 49ers of old days. They're going to continue to battle it out over and over again for AFC championships, for Super Bowl appearances, in the playoffs, anywhere. These are two teams that are going to see a lot of each other over the future. And, in my opinion, they're rivals right now. These two teams are rivals. The Patriots, not so much. The Patriots are going to take a back seat in the playoffs. That's obvious. Tom Brady has not been able to do anything this year. He's just not been good. But the, the, I'm sorry, the Chiefs and the Ravens are two teams that are going to be battling each other's, holding onto each other's throats for years to come. And this year really is the first year that's happening. And you see it. The Chiefs knew that Terrell Suggs might not show up to them. They claimed him knowing that. That's what they did. They claimed him knowing he might not show up. Now they needed help as an edge rusher because Alex Okafor, right, their edge rusher, got injured. I think it was a a knee injury or something. I don't know the specifics. But he had to go to the IR. They were, he was out for the year. So Suggs had a benefit to him in that he could actually help the team. But also, they were able to stop the Ravens from getting stronger and make themselves now stronger with Suggs on the team. So when the Chiefs do come to Baltimore for the AFC Championship, which I entirely expect to happen, the Ravens don't have sucks. They don't have a guy who's going to hit that edge. That's the one thing the Ravens' defense needs, is someone who can set the edge against outside rushers. That's what the Ravens' defense needs. That's what sucks can do for the Ravens. He's not going to be your total sack package like he was in years past. He's slowed down. He's 37 years old. He has five and a half sacks this year, over 13 games. Hardly the sucks we knew just two years ago. But the Chiefs... At least, at least, even if it doesn't work out for them, at least ensure the Ravens don't get to use him against them in a crucial AFC Championship matchup, a divisional round matchup, if, you know, they're not a a, um, a first-round bye team. You know, who knows, right? But at least for them, they won't have to face a Ravens team with Terrell Suggs on it, which would have the whole last-ride mentality of Ray Lewis The team would rally around him and get even stronger. It's not what the Chiefs would want. Absolutely not. And there are other teams that put claims on um, Terrell Suggs. Let me see if I can find that right here. I didn't put that in the show notes, as I should have. I do this every week. I forget something, and it comes to my head immediately. Um, I know that the Baltimore Ravens did not put a claim on Terrell Suggs, actually. Um, Now... You might be thinking, well, did the Ravens even want him? You know, I had people on Twitter telling me, you know, as I, I published an article, rightfully so, Chiefs steal Suggs from Ravens, right? That was the headline. And people were like, well, Mr. Linfon, how could they possibly steal from the Ravens? The Ravens didn't even want him. They didn't put a claim on him. That's not exactly how it worked, and, and I'll explain why. The Ravens, as the last team in the waiver line, okay, knew their chances of getting Suggs were super low, but if they were to get Suggs, they didn't want to pay Suggs a measly 400000 or 300000 whatever he's getting for the last two games. They wanted to give him a Ravens contract for Suggs. They wanted to sign him to his, his own deal. Maybe that deal included another year, I don't know, but the Ravens wanted to sign Suggs to their own deal. That was the point. That's why the Ravens didn't put in a claim for Terrell Suggs. It's not that they didn't want him. No, they wanted him.
but they didn't put in a claim because they didn't need to. If if he survived to their them and he explicitly wanted to come to the Baltimore Ravens, there was no question to anybody he wanted to go to Baltimore. Why even put in a claim? Just sign him to your own deal. Give him the money he deserves. That was the point. Um, another team that signed or tried to sign him or claim him, I should say, um, the 49ers attempt to claim Terrell Suggs. The New Orleans Saints attempted to claim Terrell Suggs. And I believe the Seattle Seahawks attempted to claim Terrell Suggs. Yeah, Saints, 49ers, Seahawks, and Chiefs all decided to claim Suggs. There was 0.0% chance. Terrell Suggs was reaching Baltimore. Now, the interesting thing, the only AFC team, because again, a lot of AFC teams would not want Suggs to become a Raven. The only one that actually attempted to get him was the Chiefs. The Patriots did not put in a claim for Suggs. Everyone thought the Patriots would. They didn't. The Houston Texans maybe would have put in a claim for Suggs, people thought. They did not. It's very interesting. But the Saints, 49ers, Seahawks, and Chiefs all put in a claim for Suggs. And of course, congratulations to the Chiefs because you're getting a, a terrific player. Lifeblood of the defense for years. I have nothing but good things to say about Terrell Suggs. Some people were telling me how awful Terrell Suggs is. No. Terrell Suggs was a leader on this team. He's a good person, a leader for any football team that has him. He's a great guy. It's business. He wanted to try out. Arizona, I understand. It's his hometown team. I don't hold that against him. I really don't. It's just really a shame that a 17-year veteran here is subject to waivers, subject to waivers, in the first place. Why? Right? Why is Suggs even... Does he even have to go through the waiver system? Why can't he just choose to go where he goes? He's 37 years old. He's been in the league for 17 years. The least the league could do for him... He's allowing him to choose his own destiny. But that's not what the NFL has done. And it's, it's a problem for a lot of free agents, in my opinion. Veteran free agents. And I get, you want parity, right? But for someone that far up in his career, how, I mean, he's not like, it, it's, it's not like Aaron Donald was just cut, right? And you don't want him going to the Patriots. I get that. Terrell Suggs is not Aaron Donald anymore. He's not even Terrell Suggs anymore. Well, he's Terrell Suggs, but he's not the Terrell Suggs we knew. So it is, in my opinion, dumb. He is not able to choose his own team this late in his career. But he is reportedly planning to report to the Kansas City Chiefs. So it looks like, at least for now, he's going to be a member of the Chiefs. They have a number picked out for him. I think he's number 94, which looks horrendous. Suggs should be 55. You know, he wasn't 55 on the Cardinals. He was 56. That was even worse. But 94, that's like a defensive line number, not an outside linebacker. So, um, unfortunately, the Ravens can't get Suggs. That's how the saga ends with Terrell Suggs. It, it is unfortunate. It's really, really unfortunate. We would have really loved to see Terrell Suggs one last ride in Baltimore, go for a Super Bowl ring, and get it. Now, but my theory, though, I, and I said this on Twitter... Not so much a theory as, as it could happen. Let's say Lamar Jackson's attempting to run for a game-winning touchdown and Suggs is the only man that can stop him. What are the chances that Suggs just, quote-unquote, falls to the ground and lets Lamar Jackson walk in? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Ultimate revenge for the Chiefs for, for not letting him go to Baltimore. It's possible. Not, I don't think it's going to happen, but it's possible. You know, he still loves Baltimore. Anyway, though, um, so that's the Terrell Suggs saga. Moving on to something a little bit more exciting for the Ravens. The Ravens have tied an NFL record and broken a franchise record. Ready for this? 12 Pro Bowlers selected to the 2020 Pro Bowl. 12. You can't count them on your fingers. Two alternates as well. And we'll talk about all these guys in a second here. But first, I want to remind you Wherever you are listening, make sure you either follow, subscribe, like, whatever the term is. If it's YouTube, Spotify, Overcast, Google Podcasts, iTunes, whatever. Subscribe, follow, like it, rate it, whatever. Helps the podcast, helps us reach more people, grow 
the podcast. That's what we're trying to do here is grow a Ravens community that can discuss Ravens football together and do all these things. Now, again, in recent weeks, I haven't gotten questions. I got a bunch of questions to start when I started asking for questions. I haven't gotten questions in a while. So if you have any questions for the Nest Talk podcast, it doesn't have to be a Ravens question. It could be what I think of Baker Mayfield's play this year, right? You can absolutely ask me any question about anything NFL-related, even just sports-related, maybe life-related, depending on the question. I don't know. But if you want to ask questions, we love to address questions in the Nest Talk podcast. So please send them on Twitter to at Nest Talk or put them in the comment section of the YouTube channel. And if we have a question next week or a couple questions, I'll be sure to answer them. But, you know, again, I really want to foster a community here that has great Ravens discussions. And that's the point. Conversations, Ravens conversations. Um, So if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Love to have some dialogue with you guys. Um, I'm looking to maybe do one of the things I'm thinking about doing for the podcast. I'll spoil it right now for you guys. Is a call-in section, essentially. um, Either a voice recording or a live call-in of questions we'll see how that goes I don't know how technically that can be done but I'm thinking about doing that at some point at least if we get big enough to the point where we can have a huge audience per episode hundreds of hundreds of people on YouTube hundreds of people on iTunes Spotify etc reaching the thousands because we are reaching hundreds of people let me tell you that this podcast does reach hundreds doesn't reach thousands so if we get to thousands we will definitely do that because then we'll assuredly have enough um We'll see how that goes, though. But I would like at some point to do a, a call-in type section, like a like a sports talk radio. Um, but we'll see how that goes. If you have suggestions for anything for the podcast, I mean, you don't have to leave questions. If you have a suggestion for the podcast, leave it. Tweet me at it. You can email us at the Baltimore Feather contact page. Perfect way to do that, too. Um, leave it in the YouTube section comments. Anything you want for the podcast, questions, you know, comments, concerns, suggestions, all will be taken. But back to the story here. The Ravens' 12 Pro Bowlers, count them, 12, ties an NFL record. And they are by far ahead of every other team in the National Football League in Pro Bowl count. I believe the New Orleans Saints had seven total players. Um, So that's five players extra. And the Ravens have two alternates, too. And there's 44 teams. I'm sorry, there's 44 players per team. Um, I think... That was either Aaron Kassinitz or Jameson Hensley tweeted that out. Just remember that. 44 players per team. The Ravens have 12. That's like 30%, more than 30% for the AFC's Pro Bowl team. That's nuts. And and just a side note, I am so glad that we're back to AFC, NFC Pro Bowls. You know, the whole the, the team captain selecting thing was interesting. It was a kind of way to get people to watch the Pro Bowl. But I like the AFC, NFC way better. Then let's say Team Dion, and no offense to Dion, because I love me some Dion Sanders, but Team Dion or Team, you know, Irvin, it's just more fun to have them as NFC versus AFC. And of course, you know, the Pro Bowl, it's kind of meaningless. You know, no one actually plays in the Pro Bowl. They just goof around a little bit. And I get it. You know, it's a, it's a violent sport. You're going to get hurt if you actually play hard. So they're trying to increase them with more and more money every year to increase the, the value of the Pro Bowl, but it's not going to happen. It never will happen. The Pro Bowl will always kind of be that game that everyone just goofs off in and no one really watches. That's, that's, that's what the Pro Bowl is. But it's a good experience for fans. And, and you know, if you have the chance to go to the Pro Bowl, I, I highly recommend it. I've never been, but from my understanding, it's a very fun time. I think there's other activities you can do throughout the week, um, you know, kind of like what they're doing with the NFL Draft. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe I'll get there one day. But uh, here are the Pro Bowlers. Now, there should be a, a few, not very many surprises here. Um, and, and starting with the number one not surprising player to be named to the Pro Bowl, everybody listening to this probably knows who I'm about to say. It's Lamar Jackson, you know, the guy who is pretty much locked up the MB, MVP award at this point. I don't see anybody overtaking him at this point. Lamar Jackson is in his first Pro Bowl here. He led all players with fan votes. I think it was 700,000. Second place was like 500,000. I think it was Pat Mahomes or someone or maybe Drew Brees. But still, like a 200,000 about, you know, give or take, you know, 50,000. About a 200,000 vote gap. Just undisputed MVP at this point, in my opinion. No question he was going to make the Pro Bowl. And this is the Ravens' first quarterback Pro Bowl appearance 
theoretically, because, you know, he might not actually play in the Pro Bowl, but he's first named to the Pro Bowl for a very long time. Joe Flacco was named to a Pro Bowl once in 2014, but he was an alternate that was then invited in. He was not named on the first ballot, okay? And he actually declined that Pro Bowl because he had a, a child on the way, so that was that. But, you know, this is huge for the Ravens. They haven't had a quarterback go to the Pro Bowl like this for a very long time. I actually don't know who the last one is. I should have looked that up. Now I'm just thinking about it. Maybe it was Steve McNair. I doubt it went that far back to Vinny Testaverde, right? It, no way it was Vinny. It was probably Steve McNair. So we have to look that one up. But um, Lamar Jackson is going to the Pro Bowl. You know, this is all assuming the Ravens don't go to the Super Bowl, which, you know, at this point, they probably will. Um, you know, knock on wood, right? Lamar Jackson selected. Mark Ingram is selected to his third Pro Bowl. Um, two in New Orleans, one here. I think he's on pace for 1,000 yards. I think he's just underneath 1,000. He should hit it tomorrow, although it's possible he doesn't, but I really expect him to hit it tomorrow. Um, another first-time Pro Bowler, Patrick Ricard, the fullback. Excellent for him. You know, he. people forget. He was somewhat in danger last year of, of being cut off the roster. He, a lot of inactive games for him. Didn't play a whole lot last year. Played a lot in 2017, not a whole lot in 2018, but came back roaring this year. Has a huge role as a fullback in this offense. And the Ravens, of course, love their fullbacks. You go back, Vonta Leach was an excellent fullback. Kyle Juszczyk, another excellent fullback. Another excellent fullback in Pat Ricard. And now he's making a Pro Bowl, so great for him. Um, he was just extended, to to a nice contract. So he'll be here a while. And this Pro Bowl is probably one of many to come. Speaking of many, first of many Pro Bowls to come, Mark Andrews has made the Pro Bowl. Another one, his first time Pro Bowl. And this highlights, him and Ricard actually highlight, and there's another player in here we'll talk about that highlights this. The Ravens can find talent deep in the draft. First of all, Pat Ricard was undrafted, okay? How many undrafted players go to Pro Bowls. I don't know the statistic, but it's got to be very, very, very low. It's got to be very, very few. Mark Andrews was a third-round pick. People forget that. Mark Andrews was the 2018 third-round pick at tight end. He was picked two rounds after the Ravens picked Hayden Hurst. And don't get me wrong, Hayden Hurst last year was not good. I mean, he was okay, but he wasn't good. This year, he's pretty good. The Ravens have a three-headed dragon at the tight end position. And Hayden Hurst, you know, wasn't great last year, but this year he's really come on, really expanded his role in the offense. He was hurt all last year, so it's understandable. Didn't make the Pro Bowl, wasn't good enough to make the Pro Bowl, but Mark Andrews, really the Dennis Pitta type, you know, player in this this Ravens offense, this Ravens tight ends group, and he makes a Pro Bowl for it. And it's great accomplishment. He's, I think he's our leading receiver. I believe so. Um, another person to make his first Pro Bowl, and this is kind of overdue. Ronnie Stanley. Why did Ronnie Stanley not make another Pro Bowl to this point? Honestly, I can't tell you. He's been pretty stout. Now, I had this conversation with Ken McCusick over at Film Study. I don't know if Ronnie Stanley is the best left tackle in the league, but I think he's up there, top three, top five. You know, I'm not very good at grading offensive linemen. I'm not going to lie. I can't say he's the best in the league right now at left tackle, but he possibly is. He's at least top three, top five. But why has he not made a Pro Bowl? Why didn't he make it last year? He was like a second-team All-Pro last year, right? Something like that. Didn't make the Pro Bowl. Very strange. But he's in his first Pro Bowl. The Ravens have to, have to, have to, have to, have to, have to extend him this year, right? Going into next year, I would really, 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 really appreciate Eric DaCosta if you could get on that and get this guy locked up long-term in Baltimore like you've done for a lot of other, other players. Don't let him hit the open market. Don't let what happened to C.J. Mosley happen to Ronnie Stanley. Unacceptable if you do. Another player to make the Pro Bowl, another offensive lineman, no surprise, Marshall Yanda is entering his eighth Pro Bowl. His eighth one. Eight Pro Bowls. That's a lot of Pro Bowls. And this is only his, what, 13th year or something? So he makes... And he's made most Pro Bowls since like 2011 or some ridiculous thing. He just keeps making him. He's a borderline Hall of Famer. I'm not sure he will go to the Hall of Fame. 
but he's borderline Hall of Famer. He's very close. He's very close, if not in. I don't think he'll ever be a first ballot Hall of Famer, but if he gets in the Hall of Fame, it might take a few years. But I think it's definitely possible at this point. And Marshall Yonda deserves it. Really does. He's playing very well. For this far into his career, he's playing very well. What is his 13th year, I think? Yeah, very well. Another player that demonstrates the Ravens' ability to find talent late in the draft is Matthew Judon. He is entering his first Pro Bowl. And Matthew Judon's a guy we were kind of waiting for for a few years. A 2016 fifth-round pick. That showed flashes in 16 and 17. and 18, we just assumed he would kind of show up and become the best pass rusher on the team. Zadaria Smith kind of filled that role. I mean, there was a lot of guys that were in and out of that pass rush last year. Suggs was still here. And Judon was good, but he wasn't what he was, is now. He's a dominant pass rusher right now. There's no question. The Ravens' pass rush has really increased its, its game over the past few weeks. You know, past few months, they, they really sucked in the beginning of the year. There's no question. They sucked. They were trash in the beginning of the year. But the guys on the team got actually, they just kept getting better. They improved. Judon improved every week. And you see it. And Jalen Ferguson, major improvements. Major. I love what I'm seeing out of Jalen Ferguson right now. He's got a lot of potential long term. Some other guys who I can't think of their names right now after Pernell McPhee got hurt, right? Tyus Bowser is another one. He's stepped up at some points. He's not perfect, but he's stepped up at some points. So you have this kind of interesting dynamic of the Ravens' pass rush. It was never great this season, but it's been increasingly better every week. And Judon, especially against the Rams, that was his best game by far. Pressure, 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 hit, sack, pressure, pressure, pressure. It was just over and over again. And that's what we like to see. That's what we love to see. Now, if Suggs was back, obviously the, the pass rush would have been exponentially better because you could even rotate guys in and out, keep them fresh. Not meant to be, unfortunately. But Judon, I think, gets a well-deserved nod. I believe he has nine sacks so far this year. Let me check that right now because it's another thing. As you all know, if you're a longtime listener, I always have this problem or I think I'm ready to, sh- to do the show. And then I'm like, well, you know, I go off on a tangent. And then I'm like, well, how many sacks did Judon have? I don't know. Let's check. He has, I'm sorry, eight and a half. So, really close to nine. He should finish above nine this year if he gets half a sack. Uh, he'll finish with nine, but I would imagine he could probably finish at ten. And this is the most sacks he's had in a career. 2017, he had eight, um, which, you know, was the reason a lot of us thought that 2018 would be even better. Nine sacks this year, really. It's definitely his best year. Um... If he gets to nine, at least. But he still has more sacks than the other year. Um, this is not his most combined tackles. 2017 was his most combined tackles with 58. But um, 29 quarterback hits this year. So tons of pressure. Tons. And, of course, we do like what he's doing for us. And he's another guy. we got to lock him down. There's a few guys on here we got to lock down long term. Um, another guy I want to lock down long term, entering his first Pro Bowl, Marlon Humphrey. Come on, Eric, let's go. Let's get this guy locked down. Lock him down now. Marlon Humphrey entering his first Pro Bowl, 2017 first-round pick. Last year we thought he might make it, didn't make it. This year obviously has to make it. He's one of the best corners in the game. Makes the Pro Bowl, no question there. Marcus Peters made the Pro Bowl too. He's another guy. I mean, there's a lot of guys on here. I keep saying it. Lock him down, Eric. Lock him down. Of course, we finessed the Los Angeles Rams for Marcus Peters, and it's so funny because... We gave up. Ready for this? If you don't remember how we got Marcus Peters. This is what happened. The Rams wanted Jalen Ramsey. Okay? They want Jalen Ramsey. So they go out and they get prepared to dish at least, I don't remember the exact deal, but it was at least two first-round picks. This and next year's first-round picks for Mr. Jalen Ramsey. Okay? Marcus Peters has to be put on the market then. They can't afford both. They don't want both. They think Marcus Peters is washed up. He He's too wild for them. The Ravens needing some secondary help, right? They say, okay, well, we're not going to spend two first-round picks on Jalen Ramsey. That's, that's just dumb. That's really, really dumb, okay? Why would you do that? Why would you spend two first-round picks on a guy who, I mean, he's great. Jalen Ramsey's great, don't get me wrong. But it's not it's not worth two first round picks. It's just not. Not for him. 
No. He's not the best ever. He's not Deion Sanders out there, okay? Anyway, so the Ravens essentially, I mean, this is before Jalen Ramsey's trade happens, but the Ravens essentially know the Rams are trying to get rid of Peters for a reason. It's got to be Ramsey. So they trade, and I kid you not, if you don't remember, I kid you not, they trade a fifth-round pick and Kenny Young for Marcus Peters, who right now, on the Ravens, is playing better, in my opinion, than Jalen Ramsey with the Rams. This is a highway robbery, it was. A complete highway robbery. Eric DaCosta finessing them. And the funniest, the absolute funniest thing about the whole episode is the Ravens had an extra fifth round pick. And they got that extra fifth round pick from trading Kerry Vedvik to the Minnesota Vikings, who then cut Kerry Vedvik after the offseason because he, they realized he couldn't be their kicker. He was great with Baltimore, but all of a sudden sucked with the Minnesota Vikings. I have no idea what happened. None. None whatsoever. I don't understand it. But the Ravens had a free fifth-round pick, and they just gave one away with a guy who probably wasn't going to make the team next year, and, and Kenny Young, for a Pro Bowl cornerback. It's absolute, complete, utter highway robbery. There's no other way to put it. Eric DaCosta finessed the Los Angeles Rams. He finessed them. They get a Pro Bowler. For a fifth round pick and a guy they probably weren't going to hang on for for much longer. Eric DaCosta, this really, I mean, this Pro Bowl class, a lot of them is your work. Huge influence on Lamar Jackson, I understand. Mark Ingram is your signing. I'd imagine he had a huge influence on all the draft picks, really, because he was there for a long time. He's He's been Ozzy's right-hand man. But he signed Mark Ingram. He got Marcus Peters. He signed Earl Thomas. Earl Thomas made the Pro Bowl. Not sure how. He's really not that great this year. He's, I mean, he's above average, but I wouldn't say he's the best safety in the league right now. But he makes a seventh Pro Bowl. Another Pro Bowler, Justin Tucker, finally. He should have made it last year. The only thing, the only complaint I have about Justin Tucker this year, two wonky point-after attempts that didn't go in. A little scary. Had one last year. I don't want to get to three next year. Let's Everybody calm down, though, because it's, it's Justin Tucker. He's probably fine. Just, you know stupid conditions, um, you know, kicking that field goal in, in that huge monsoon. If you were not at the game for the San Francisco 49ers, you have no idea how much it was actually raining. The cameras did not do it justice. I was in the stands. There was no way he should have made that kick from 40-some yards. That was the sloppiest game I've ever seen, I've ever been to. It was terrible. I stood up for the entire second half. Traffic was so bad getting to that game. I was coming back from Thanksgiving. Um, I, I couldn't get to the game until the second half, and I stood up for the entire second half because the seat was so soaked. I just stood there for two whole quarters in the rain. It was crazy, terrible, but it was the most important Ravens win, perhaps, of the year. But anyway, the point is, Justin Tucker should not have made that kick. A normal kicker should not have made that kick. Of course, Justin Tucker is no normal kicker, though, and he made that kick to win the game. Long snapper Morgan Cox is entering his third pro ball as well. Um, he, you know, long snapper, it, I don't know how long snappers are actually determined, but the whole Wolf Pack deserves to be in. Noticeably absent from the Pro Bowl, Sam Cook, Orlando Brown Jr., two alternates for the Ravens. Orlando Brown Jr. would enter his first Pro Bowl if he's chosen to go in. Of course, if they go to the Super Bowl, he won't be going to the Pro Bowl. And if Sam Cook goes to the Pro Bowl, it would be his second. He's only been to one before. I think it was... In the early 2010s. I have to look that up though. Um, again it breaks a franchise record. It ties an NFL record 12. You know for those Pro Bowl selections. Refreshing for a change. As I said in this article though. It's refreshing. Because how many Pro Bowls do the Ravens usually get in? Only a few. 12 this year. And if you are looking to go to the Pro Bowl. It is in January. January 26th in Orlando, Florida. Hopefully though I don't. I hope no Ravens will actually play in it. Because that would mean. We go to the Super Bowl. That's more important to me than Pro Bowl votes. Um, one more news story to talk about before we preview the the Browns game. We have no um, game review this week, obviously, because we recorded last week's episode on the Friday after the Jets game. So, um, you know, 
there's there's nothing to to talk about. There hasn't been a game since that Thursday night. But of course, we get the game against the Cleveland Browns tomorrow, Sunday. We are recording a day late, if you don't know. Um, that's going to be the big game of of really quite a long time now. The Ravens won the division with the the um, they clinched the division, being the Jets, but they clinch a first round by the number one seed specifically with a win over Cleveland. So that's going to be huge, a huge game in Cleveland. Hopefully the Ravens can pull that one out and not lose twice to Cleveland. Now, one more news story. Kenneth Dixon. Yeah, that Kenneth Dixon. You know, the one who really didn't do a whole lot for us after a lot of us thought in 2016 he would do something for us. Was either signed or claimed. I don't know if he was signed or claimed. Signed by the New York Jets. He was not on waivers, obviously. He was a free agent all year. Duh. Um... Signed by the New York Jets. Honestly, I hope he does well. The reason he didn't do a lot for us in Baltimore, injury, 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 every year. His knee, his meniscus, his everything. He was like made of peanut brittle. He just could not sustain an NFL workload. Every year he got injured. I'm pretty sure it was every year, actually. I am very, very certain it was every single year. 2016, we had to wait four games for him to come in. At least four games, I think. 2017, he got suspended and injured. I think he was out like the whole year, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Uh, 2018, he was placed on the IR after week one. He came back late in the year. Got 333 rushing yards. I think a touchdown or two. You know, became that one-two punch with Gus Edwards late in the year when the Ravens kind of redid their offense to, to tailor to Lamar Jackson before he could actually throw properly. Um, so, Kenneth Dixon, he has some upside. If he's not the number one back, if he's not getting a whole lot of work, if he can stay healthy, I think he can do something for some teams. He was signed on the Jets on the 18th, uh, my birthday, actually. You know, so, what's he going to do late in the year? maybe beat a team. I think the Jets are playing someone kind of important this week, but I forget who they're playing. Um, let's check. But, you know, I, I they're probably just trying him out for next year. Joe Douglas has gotten a lot of Ravens players. C.J. Mosley, Alex Lewis, Maurice Kennedy, now Kenneth Dixon. I think there's another one, too, I'm forgetting. So, I don't know who the Jets are playing. I think they're playing somebody important for our playoff implications. Um, it might be the Chiefs. I don't know. Let, let's just check. I keep saying we're going to check, and then I don't check. Jets schedule. I know. I should always, always do a full outline, but every time I think I'm ready to go, I'm not ready to go. They play the the Steelers. That's why. I want them I want them to beat the Steelers so the Steelers don't make the playoffs. That's the hope. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. I, I really doubt it. Um, but anyway... Kenneth Dixon heading over to the New York Jets. Not a bad spot for him. You know, Adam Gase is a pretty bad head coach. I think he's a decent offensive mind, but a bad coach. But, you know, it's just, he's just trying out for next year and other teams too. We'll see how it works out for him. Um, Moving on to our last segment of the day, the Cleveland Browns, of course, beat the Baltimore Ravens. They're the last team to beat the Baltimore Ravens. They beat them in September. The Ravens have not lost since then. Can the Cleveland Browns beat the Baltimore Ravens again at this point? And my preview and predictions will come out today, you know, as we kind of have a doubleheader today since we're a day late on the podcast. But I will tell you this. Do I think the Cleveland Browns have a chance to win? No. No, I, 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 I don't. I don't. The only possible way the Cleveland Browns could win this game is first... If the Patriots lose to the Buffalo Bills today, that forces the Patriots out of the conversation for a number one seed overall. Okay? And remember, the Ravens can clinch the number one seed with a win over the Browns. So, that's first. That's the first thing I think has to happen. The Ravens have to go in knowing that they're very much in control of their destiny. So maybe they light up a little bit, but the Kansas City Chiefs are still in the conversation for that first round first round by the first seed overall okay now I would say they would have to lose too but of course the Patriots play today we play tomorrow and the Kansas City Chiefs play the Sunday night game so it that has no bearing on it but maybe the Ravens kind of loosen up a little bit you know 
not on purpose, of course, but maybe knowing that they have a very, very high chance of, of winning the division, I'm sorry, winning the, the first seed, they loosen up a little bit. That's really the only way I could see it happening. If the Patriots beat the Bills, the Ravens are going to go all out. And honestly, I do, even if the Patriots beat, beat uh, don't beat the Bills, I expect the, the Ravens to go all out on the Browns because they want that first seed no matter what happens with Kansas City. They don't want to wait around. And I think we get to 11 straight wins. I really do. I think it's not even going to be close. The way Baker Mayfield's playing, I think Baker Mayfield's a very good quarterback. And I'm going to take, I might take heat for this. I think he's a very good quarterback, just with a really, really, really bad coach. I think Freddie Kitchens is a terrible head coach. That, in my opinion, is really what's going on. I don't think it's really Baker Mayfield's exact fault. I think the play calling is atrocious. I think the way the team is structured is atrocious. I think that he has no way to discipline his team. It's falling apart of the scenes. There's no discipline. There's no structure to this team. This is what happens when you hire a young coach who's never really done anything in his career. He just happened to be, you know, you don't, only the bad teams hire coaches for quarterbacks. I mean, maybe Matt LaFleur is an exception, but I think the Packers got lucky with him. Or maybe Aaron Rodgers is carrying the team again. But if you hire a coach for specifically for a quarterback, you are really dumb. That's really dumb. Quarterbacks play for the coach, not the other way around. And that's essentially what the Browns did with Freddie Kitchens. They hired Freddie Kitchens specifically because they thought he'd coach Baker Mayfield well. That's just dumb. That's dumb. You could have had Mike McCarthy. Yeah, Super Bowl winning coach Mike McCarthy was on the market. Greg Williams, the guy who led your team almost to the playoffs. Almost to a winning season after dumping Hugh Jackson, right? You could have had him too. But instead, you go with the offensive coordinator, who I think was coaching high school level or selling cars or some ridiculous thing beforehand. And look, I get it. People come from all over the place and do well. But he was not nearly experienced enough. Not nearly experienced enough for this job. He was not qualified for the the job. And that really, I think, is the biggest problem with the Browns. I think if they had Mike McCarthy, honestly, they'd probably be a playoff team. Not winning the division. We're too good. We're too good. They wouldn't win the division. But they'd be a wild card team. But it's a stupid move by the Browns what they did. Now, does that mean that we're going to curb stomp the Browns? No. It doesn't mean anything. It means that if I think we're going to win, but we're going to have to win, I think, a little bit dirtier than normal. Not too dirty. I think it's going to be still a decent margin between us and the Browns, but they're going to hang around a little bit. You know, Baker Mayfield's not scared of us. He beat Lamar once. Lamar beat him once. He beat the he beat Flacco once. He's two and one against the Ravens. The Ravens can make it two and two, but the Browns really aren't fighting for anything, aside from pride, if they have any, and being the Ravens. Now I'm not going to give my official score predictions, of course, until preview and predictions comes out, because I'm really not exactly sure yet. I haven't made the prediction yet. I'm still mulling it over. I think it's a win. I think it's not that you know, blowouty of like a Rams game, let's say. I think it's going to be a little closer than we're accustomed to. But it's not going to be, it's not going to be too close to the point where we can actually lose the game. That's my, that's my honest opinion. Now, who are the key players for the Browns though? How can the Browns actually turn this around? They're going to need a heck of a day from Baker Mayfield if they want any shot of winning this game. They're going to need him throwing 300 touchdowns, I'm sorry, 300 touchdowns, 300 yards, three touchdowns, no picks, you know, like perfect passer rating. That's when they need out of Baker Mayfield. And the problem is the Ravens secondary, you know, Jimmy Smith, Marlon Humphrey, Brandon Carr, Marcus Peters, Earl Thomas, Chuck Clark. These aren't guys you want to be throwing to, throwing into. And he's going to have to. And Baker Mayfield, you know, he faced a completely different Ravens team in week four. A 100% different Ravens team. The Ravens team that lost the Browns in Week 4 is not the same Ravens team that is playing the Browns in Week 16. They are all completely different. If you look at the defense, and you look at who was starting inside linebacker, who was starting at, at cornerback, I mean, we didn't have Marcus Peters. We didn't have Josh Bynes. We didn't have LJ Fort. We didn't have Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith was out. Okay. Tony Jefferson was still in. Chuck Clark was not in yet. Earl Thomas was kind of shaky. I mean, it's a wildly different team. Right? So, 
All these midseason signings. We didn't have Jihad Ward. No Demata Pecco. I'm forgetting somebody huge that we signed midseason. Can't think of him. But the point is, the Ravens defense remolded itself, thanks to Eric DaCosta, thanks to the great work by Wink Martindale for actually being able to tailor his defense to the new players. They completely reworked this team. This is not the same team. So Baker Mayfield's in for a surprise if he thinks it's going to be the same darn thing. Because he better know it's not. Freddie Kitchens better prepare them for different things. They better not do the same game plan because if they do, they're done for. Now, I don't think Freddie Kitchens is that bad to the point where he wouldn't actually recognize the changes in the Ravens' defense and address those. But I don't think the, the Browns actually have the firepower, the, the game plan, to go out and beat the Ravens on defense here. For offense versus defense, I should say. Nick Chubb, I think he would be pretty crucial to a ra- to a potential Browns upset too. Have to have a great game on the ground, establish that ground game, take pressure off Mayfield so he can throw those touchdowns, those, those, those passes, maybe 100 yards, 150 yards from Nick Chubb would do it. I mean, to get to a, a Browns victory, it would take an all-out crazy effort. I just don't see it happening. I'm just saying if this happened, it's possible. You know, 450 total yards between those two players would be insane. Be completely insane. But that might be what it takes to be the Ravens at this point. And of course, Jarvis Landry should be their leading receiver. Odell Beckham this year has been like a ghost. What's going on with him? I can see why he wants out of Cleveland. It's not been very good to him. Jarvis Landry, not so great this year. But of course, the whole offense is not so great at all. He would have to have a a a, a maybe the best game of the season. Over 100 yards receiving. Maybe a touchdown or two. But again... I just don't see any of this happening. I do not. But the key players, again, if the Browns were to make a vic- make a victory lap on the Ravens, you know, sweep them. Baker Mayfield, 300, 300 yards, three touchdowns would be needed. Nick Chubb, five, 100 yards to 150 yards. And, of course, Jarvis Landry, maybe 100 yards as well in the air, too. Um, so, again, that game is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Sunday, December 22nd in Cleveland. If you're going, let me know. I'd like to know how many of my Ravens uh, flock members, the feather flockers and nest talkers out there, um, travel to away games or if you're in the Cleveland area. I was looking, interestingly, not to not to uh, go off point before we end the episode here, I was looking at some of the stats. I, I switched over to a new podcasting host recently, and they provide stats based on where people listen to. I found it really interesting that a lot of you guys are not actually from Maryland. My top viewer base is not from Maryland. It's from Virginia. So there's a lot of you actually listening from Virginia, which I thought is pretty interesting. You know, Virginia, I think, let me check right now. Because it was very surprising to me, because I thought I would be like 70% Maryland. But it's very distributed between a lot of different places. Virginia, 28%. There's a lot of you from Massachusetts as well. Oklahoma, Maryland, it's it's Virginia with 28% viewership. Massachusetts with 24%. Oklahoma, 16%. Maryland only has 11% of the pie. Some of you in Florida, I, I think I knew that already, though. New Mexico, there's a few of you. California, there's a couple, maybe one in Pennsylvania, New York. District of Columbia, that kind of makes sense. North Carolina, and under 1% in Tennessee, South Carolina, and New Jersey. But a lot of Virginia listeners didn't expect that. I thought that was more Redskins country, but I guess a lot of you guys down there like the Baltimore Ravens as well, or at least are trying to see what we're doing. Maryland, of course, I knew you guys were here. So all you Maryland listeners, Virginia, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, anywhere, even if you're from Jersey. I like you all anyway. Um, so that's going to wrap up today's episode. Um, we will be back next week, hopefully on time. And of course, again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. I am really, really hopeful that you have a fantastic holiday season. Spend it with your family, your friends, everyone who you love. It's just a fantastic time of year. Again, it's my favorite time of the year. I love the, you know, the decorations, the Christmas spirit. It's just honestly my favorite time. Every year I look forward to it. The perfect time of year. Have a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate again. Just have a a great time. And of course, it would be even better, right, if the Ravens win tomorrow. But of course, if Santa Claus, if you're listening, I only ask for one thing this year. Ravens Super Bowl victory. That's the only thing I ask for. Um, Have a great, great rest of your weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week on Friday, presumably on the 27th. That's the goal, unless... We have to postpone again. Holiday season gets crazy. I know you all probably understand that. So, of course, we will see how you guys are doing. Uh, how I'm doing, really, to get that podcast out. Um, 
Again, if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever, Overcast, Google Podcasts, make sure you like the episode, subscribe to it, whatever it is, follow it. Um, share it with your friends. Helps out the podcast a lot. If you're on YouTube, of course, you subscribe to that. Like us there. You can leave comments, feedback on YouTube or tweet us at Nest Talk. If you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me at Chris Linfont or the Baltimore Feather at Be More Feather. Search up Nest Talk or Baltimore Feather on Facebook to find us there as well. And of course, subscribe to the email news list on the BaltimoreFeather.com. Not the BaltimoreFeather.com. BaltimoreFeather.com is the actual URL address. The Baltimore Feather. Um, we have some exciting things coming out. Hopefully, at the start of January on BaltimoreFeather.com. I really, really hope it gets out in time because I'm super excited about it. I really am excited. Hopefully, some new things come to the podcast, too. We'll be working on a lot of it over this. Uh, I have an extended break here over the, the holiday season. If you don't know, I'm a college student, actually. So uh, I've got about a month to do some things for, for that I couldn't do during the year. So I'd like to get some things rolling for the website, for the podcast, over this break. Um i will see how all of that works. Again, this is Nest Talk, episode 57. Next week will be 58. We'll see you then after the Ravens presumably beat the, the Cleveland Browns, you know, knock on wood. But um, if they lose, we can, we'll still recap. It won't be the end of the world. They just need one more win to secure the number one overall seed. Um, so thank you for listening to Nest Talk. Uh, we'll see you again next week. This is Christopher Linfont of the Baltimore Feather signing out. Have a Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays to all of you.